in uh, Philippians 4, 4, he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, Rejoice. Rejoice how often? Always. When great things happen. When you're at a high point in your life. Always. Well, yeah, but is that the only time? Yes. You know, I read a thing some years ago. It's, it told how frequently little, most little children laugh. And I mean it was like oh, scores or hundreds of times sometimes a day. And then by the time somebody is 30 or 40 years old, it dropped down to hardly anything with some people. Well, is that good or not? The Bible said unless you be converted and become as a little child, you won't enter into those things of God, the kingdom of God. Rejoice in the Lord. Are we supposed to be rejoicing all the time? Yes. Yes. Well, now you're not going to be rejoicing about evil things. You're not going to be rejoicing about tragedies. But even in the midst of something bad, you can rejoice about something good. Right? And it, that, it, that's the choice of our focus. And that's faith or fear, victory or defeat. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. And again, I say rejoice. Keep reading. Let your moderation, one translation says, let your sweet reasonableness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Keep going. Be careful for nothing. Now, the word care here means anxiousness, anxiety. We'd probably say, don't be anxious about anything. Should we take the Word of God seriously? Yes. Is it possible to go day in and day out and not be anxious yes. or worried or fearful about anything? Yes. Hmm? Do we just ignore this? No. We act like it can't be done? No. Or is it possible? Uh, here's some advice, friends. Let the Word of God be your standard. Yes. Yes. Nothing else. Right. Nothing else. Yes. Every vision, every dream, yes. every experience, every prophecy, yes. good, bad, in between, examine it against the written Word. Yes. Is that right? Yes. And let it be your standard. Right. And if you'll be honest, and you're reading your chapter every day, like all good faith life people do. <laughs> At least that. Then you will be coming across things in the Word that's above where you're living. I said you frequently, commonly, frequently, you'll come across things in the Word that's, a, that's a, up here and you're living here. Then you got a choice. Are we going to try to explain it away? Are we going to say that's passed away? That's not for us. Are you going to try to water down the Word no. to fit your experience? No. Or are you going to have the respect for the Word and have the faith to say, Lord, I'm not living there right now. Amen. Elevate my life and experience yes. to match this. Yes. You'll have to make that choice every time you get there. Hmm? So humble, humble yourself, be honest, and go, well, I, I hadn't been living there. But if you say I can live there, I can live there. If you say it's for me, it's for me. Right? And then you set your face like flint towards it, and you lay hold of it in faith and refuse to back off, and you stay on it till you get there. If it takes a week, or 10 years. Amen. All right. That's right. Everybody pray it out loud. Lord, Lord help me, help me not, to not to water down the Word, water down the word. Explain, away the Bible explain away the Bible to match my experience. To match my experience. But help me, Lord, help me, Lord to, elevate to elevate my experience, my experience. To, match your word. to match your Word. Ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Be careful for nothing. That means you, the Amplified says, do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. Hmm? Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. First um, Peter 5, you don't have to turn there, but you, you can just, we're going to be going to um, John 14. But First Peter 5, 7 says, Casting all your care, how much of it? All. all your care on him. And again, that's that same word, anxious, worried, fearful, anxiety. Casting all your anxiety on him because he cares about you and doesn't want you troubled and upset right. and fearful right. when he has already take care, taken care of everything. Yeah. Anybody with a child that cares about their child doesn't want that son or daughter worried right. and upset right. and troubled. Right. They want them happy yes. yeah. and without care and without fear. Right. But nobody ever loved their children more than our Father loves us. Yeah. And He cares about us and doesn't want us anxious, worried. Many have thought the more you care, the more you worry. The more you care about something, the more you take care about it. But that's a, that's a deception of the enemy. And it's contrary to faith. And it actually gets in the way of the Lord doing something for us. We, we've already been over this in some detail, but when the enemy comes and brings troubling thoughts and feelings to us, to cause us to, uh, to tempt us to worry and to, and to fear and be upset all the time. It's not just so he can say, goody, goody, see there, got you to do it. Come on. The Bible tells us that the cares of life can choke out the Word of God yes, out of our heart. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Choke out the Word. Right. Now what kind of danger is that? So we must, oh friend, we must stop this worrying and being fearful and upset all the time. It's the ploy of the enemy. Uh, check up on yourself. If you don't watch him and if you yield to your flesh, you'll be upset about something most of the time. All you'll have brief times when you're happy and feel good, but it won't be long, something will happen. Somebody will do something. Or oh, they didn't do something. Or oh, it's something the government did or didn't do. Or something somebody else did or didn't do. And it'll upset you. And it'll make you mad. Or it'll hurt you. Or it'll bother you. And of course you think you are thoroughly justified in feeling that way. But not realizing this is robbing you of a day of peace and joy That's right. you should be having. And it's making you absolutely no fun to be around. Sulking and mad and bitter and hurting. And just about time you get past that and you think, oh, good, good, something else. Come on, have you seen it? Something else will come for you to get upset about. And it's the ploy of the enemy to keep you and me upset about something. All the time. And what that, the reason being is to choke out the Word of God in our heart and destroy our faith and keep us in a place of, of a perpetual defeat and failure and hopelessness and anger and bitter and resentment. And friend, life is just too short to throw away days and weeks being upset. Being upset. Being upset. Somebody say, not me, not me, not me. I can live being anxious about nothing. Nothing. Anxious for nothing. I can live that way. The Lord told me I could. Didn't, didn't just tell me I could. Told me to do it. Right? 
casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Well, if he told you to do it, can you do it? Yes. Can I do it? Yes. What do you do when you got some worries and care, something that bothers you, something that upsets you? Don't let it sit on you. Right. Right. Throw it off of you. Yes. Yes. Put it on him. Yes. Say, here, Lord, I, I, I can't fix this. I can't take care of this. Here. Right. Here. Amen. I'm giving it to you. Amen. And I'm trusting in you. And I'm not going to stay upset. Right. Amen. Just not going to do it. John 14, go there please. How many think most Christians spend entirely too much time being upset about something? Oh, yeah. Or worrying yes. or being, right? right? How much time would be okay? According to the Lord, we're not supposed to spend any time yeah. being upset. Yeah. Right. Well, that may seem like a, a high uh, bar but uh, what did we just get through praying? Don't water this down to match your lack of experience. Let God elevate you. Amen. Bring you up you. to this word. If he said it, Amen. it can happen. In John 14 and verse 1, John 14, 1 said, Let not your heart be troubled. One of the things that you'll, you'll run smack dab into when you start talking about this is people will, will, many, many, including good church going people, will, they'll hear this and whether they say it or not, they will think to themselves, yeah, but if you have this happen, you can't help it. You can't help but be upset or troubled or bothered or anxious or fearful. But that's contrary to this. I said, that's contrary to this. Jesus said what? Let not. Let not. The understood subject is, is, is what? Who? You, you are not to let your heart be troubled. Now, there's a lot of revelation there. If your heart is troubled, what do we know? How did it get that way? I let it. And what else? I didn't have to. He told me not to let it. So I can let it or not let it. It's my choice. Let's go over again this real slow. <laughs> if you are me, your spouse, your child, your coworker, anybody, are upset, why are you upset? Your heart's troubled. You're upset, you're bothered, scared, anxious, worried, fearful, whatever. How'd you get that way? How'd you get that way? Most people would disagree. They'd say, no, I was doing fine till such and such happened. <laughs> right? I was actually having a pretty good day. I was making it pretty good until, boom, that thing dropped on me. And, hey, I don't care who you are. If that happens to you, you are not going to be happy anymore. You're going to be sad. You're going to be depressed. You're going to be upset. No. 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 And, and, and if the devil can keep you believing that, you're stuck. You, you will never enjoy this. You'll just go from one crisis to another, from one episode of being upset and scared to another, and it will wreak havoc on you and your system. It'll cause you to age prematurely. It'll cause you physical problems, mental problems, financial problems, marriage problems, Family pro work problems? Right. Hmm? Right. No. The truth is, we, we, we saw this in some detail. Paul said, by the Spirit of God in Corinthians, he said, the care of the churches come on me daily. Well, you read these letters. Was everybody acting right? No. At the church at Corinth or Ephesus or Galatia or Colossae or, or Romans? Yeah. We got two churches. <laughs> he had all these churches. <laughs> and I can tell you with two churches, <laughs> Phyllis and I could stay upset about something. Do you believe that? Yeah. Every day, if, if, we would, if we would take it the wrong way, we could stay Bummed out, yeah. upset, mad, yep. hurt, and it would be a total waste of our energies. And if I let that happen to me, if Phyllis lets that happen to her, 
And that happens, so that, that continues on us, just say on me as a minister, month after month, year after year. Is that going to affect my ministry? Yes. Am I going to come in here? You know, you try to help people. <laughs> and, 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 and the Lord told us what to say, and we said it plain as day, and they sat right there and acted like you didn't say one word. <laughs> and they did this and just misrepresented the church and just went out and made a giant mess, and they did this. Is that going to bless you for me to come in every time and go, and go what is wrong with you? <laughs> Are you listening? <laughs> that's not going to bless you. And that's how the church gets small. <laughs> so you believe that I shouldn't and Phyllis shouldn't take it to heart. Is that you, you believe that we should just cast our care on the Lord and stay up and stay strong? Well, what about you? Right? I mean, what, is there a different set of rules? These verses we read didn't say, they wasn't prefaced by these are for preachers. These are not preacher verses, <laughs> minister verses, leader, pastor verses. They're believer verses, child of God verses. No, no, I don't claim that we've always done it perfectly, but that's part of maturing in faith is that more and more you learn a lot of this stuff is so trivial. I know it seems like a big deal, but from God's perspective, and in the big scheme of things, right. it's very insignificant. Yeah. And if you let it get to you and you let it hurt you and make you mad and upset you, you're being a baby. That's right. Come on. You're being immature and faithless. Do you remember what we talked about, about the two and three year old dropping their ice cream cone? Yeah. You remember that? Yeah. Or their balloon, losing their balloon. Have you ever heard wailing? Yeah. Huh? You would thought it was a national tragedy. Is that right? You would that wail like it's the end of the world. Is it the end of the world that they dropped their ice cream? So simple. Go get another ice cream, right? Yeah. Well, the things that 50-year-olds get upset and pout about for three weeks to the Lord are just as ridiculous yeah. as wailing because you lost your balloon. It's a matter of perspective and how much maturity you've gained. So, <laughs> let's believe this good word and not fight it and not try to argue with it. Look at it, verse 1 again. What did he say? John 14, 1, what? Let not your heart be troubled. Don't argue with the Lord. Don't tell him you can't help it. Don't tell him you can't help it. Say, sir, yes, sir. Huh? Sir, yes, sir. Do what? Don't let your heart be troubled. Sir, yes, sir. What are we going to do? We're not going to let our heart be troubled. How in the world are we going to do that? He's going to help us. God will provide. Verse 27. But you got to make up your mind to start with that you're not going to argue with him and try to tell him that you can't help it. He said, here, here's one of the big things why we can do this. What are we going to do instead of worry and be upset? You don't just need a vacuum in the place of that. What fills the place of worry? Peace. Peace, Jesus said, I leave with you. My peace. This is the peace he walked in himself when he was on the earth. 
We talked last time about there's a storm on the sea, and Jesus is doing what in the back of the boat? He's sleeping. He's sleeping. Did he have peace? Yeah. Is he walking in peace? Yes. You, somebody said, that's amazing. That you know, amazing. wish I said somebody might say, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure glad you're ready. I, I'm, I'm so glad. <laughs> somebody might say, man, I wish I had peace like that. You do. Yes. We do. We've been given not peace like that, that peace. You can say this, <laughs> the peace of Jesus, peace of Jesus is, mine. is mine. Come on, sit out loud. I have, I have the, peace the peace of the Christ. Of the Christ. Do you? Yes. Do you? Yes. That's how you can prevent your heart from being troubled. Come on, read the rest of it. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I to you. Then he said it again, what? Let not your heart be troubled. And he added this, neither let it be afraid. Would a lot of people try to tell you, I, I can't help it? Would a lot of people try, I can't help it? I'm afraid of what's going to happen in the country. I'm afraid of, in my neighborhood. I'm afraid. I'm afraid the doctor's going to find this. I'm afraid of the report. I'm afraid. I can't help it. Not true. That's right. Not true. That's right. We can't control the world around us. And pressures and cares are going to come. Thoughts of fear and doubt. Feelings of anxiety, and they are real. They are real, and they can be powerful. But here's the thing. Just because it comes on you, just because it comes against you, and it tries to squeeze you and oppress you, you do not have to let it in you. On you, against you, is not at all the same as in you. In you. Just because the wind is blowing against your house doesn't mean the wind is blowing through your kitchen. Is that right? Just because it's 90 degrees on top of your house doesn't mean it's 90 degrees in your bedroom, thank the Lord. Is that right? Or if it's 20 below. How many believe it can be totally different inside yes. than outside. Yes. And that's what he's talking about. Didn't he say it? Yes. Don't let it in. Yes. It's going to come. And that's sometimes what's confusing to people. They say, well, it came. I mean, the thoughts, the feelings, they're real. I know. I know. I didn't say it was all easy. But just because it comes against you does not mean you just have to throw up your hands and let it inside you. And let it torment your heart and your mind. You need to rise up and resist it and say, no, I'm not letting this upset me. I'm not letting this trouble me. I'm not letting my heart be afraid. And with his peace and his help, we can do that. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Go with me, please, to um, Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Isaiah 53. Now, if you've been with us on all of these previous messages, you might... Notice that most of what I've said for the past ever how long, we've already said in previous times. So, Mrs. Well, why don't, uh, why don't you, why do you do that? Why don't you just go on to the new material? Well, there's a reason. <laughs> there's more than one reason. <laughs> uh, Number one, 
We're endeavoring to be led by the Spirit. Right? right? Yes. And if He's prompting us to, to go over this or to stay on this, that's what you should do. Amen. Right? Yeah. No matter what you think or what you think other people think they'd like for you to do, or you want to be led by Him. Right. Not by something else. But then also, the principle, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Repetition is necessary. It's actually much more necessary than most people think. And you particularly run into a challenge of people who think they're really smart. <laughs> who think, look, I got that the first time you said it. I doubt it. I doubt it. <laughs> Just because you can repeat it back don't mean you got it. Not at all. This is not about the accumulation of knowledge. Mm -mm. No. The Word of God is not like any other book. It's not like any other word. It is alive. It's living. The anointed Word of God is alive. It's alive. And because of that, when something's alive, you look at it today and you'll see one thing, and you look at it a year from now, it's alive. Amen. You're going to see all kind of the things you didn't see because it's living. Right. Amen. Come on. And one of, the, uh, one of the best ways you can tell if you're getting it or not is your excitement level, mm -hmm. your joy. If you hear it and you go, yeah, right, I know that. <laughs> that ain't it. No. You don't got it. I know, that's, I know that's not good English, but you, are you with me or not? Yeah. No, no. Anybody that's been around the things of the Lord very long, has it happened to you that you read something, heard it, heard it preached, read it, talked about it, read it, Year after year after year, and 20 years later, on the 342nd time, you went, What? Wow. What? Wow. Whoa! Is that that's what that means? Yeah. Glory to God. I never said, I've heard, I must have heard that preach 50 times. That's what that means? <laughs> Glory to God. That's right. Amen. Now you're starting to get it. <laughs> It's not about just making a bunch of noise. The reason why you would get excited is because something has happened not just in your head. Something has happened in here. It's the quickening of the Word. And when it's alive in you, it's, uh, I mean, it's akin to an electric shock. I mean, it's quickening. It's life. Quickens. So, uh, please, don't just make it mental and don't assume that you got it because you, you can quote some definitions or rattle off some verses. It's, it's not mental. It's not mental. It's spiritual. Thank you, Lord. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Anybody got any verses marked in Isaiah? 53. Oh, if you don't, you need to do some more hearing until you get zapped and stirred up about it. Let's begin reading in verse uh, 3, Isaiah 53, 3. What's happening here? Let me preface it by saying this. It's a big mistake to ignore the Old Testament. A lot of people say, oh, that's all passed away. That's old covenant. That's not for us. That's being ignorant. The writers of the New Testament assume you know the Old Testament. And if you don't know what's happening here, you won't understand what they're talking about a lot, a lot of the time in the New. But beside that, is it the Word of God or not? Yes. Then it's alive. Yes. It's quickening. And what's happened, the prophet Isaiah, all these centuries ago, the Spirit of God let him see into the future. And he saw 
Jesus. He saw the master take our place and he didn't just see it in the flesh. He saw what happened in the spirit and he wrote it down. And it is amazing. And, and you see the, the, the recurring thought here is that it wasn't for him, it was for us. Verse 3, he is talking about Jesus. Every one of these verses is talking about Jesus, the master. He is despised and rejected of men. Was he rejected of men and despised? A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Keep going. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And if you look these words up, there are other places translated in the same King James Bible, sicknesses and pains. Amen. That's right. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Oh, this is better than your head knows. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The, the NIV said, well, well, let me keep reading. Let me keep reading. Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 7. He was what? Oppressed. Oppressed. And he was afflicted. Isn't that what we've been talking about this whole series? About the oppression of the enemy and the affliction which causes the, if you respond incorrectly, the torment, the worry, the anxiety, the pressure. Yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. Listen to the NIV on this, verse 5. Let's back up to verse 5. And this is the NIV. He was pierced for our transgressions. Centuries before Jesus hung on the cross, this was seen and written. It's amazing how accurate perfect. He was crushed for our iniquities. Now, now notice this next phrase. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. When he says, my peace I give you, it's redemptive language. Because he also gave us his righteousness. Didn't he? He gave us his holiness. He gave us his mind. We have the mind of Christ. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Jesus redeemed us completely. He went to the cross, spirit, soul, and body. And he redeemed us, spirit, soul, and body. Do you believe it or not? Yes. We don't have a partial redemption. We have a complete redemption. And everything that happened to Jesus happened for a specific reason. Nothing happened by accident or just because somebody decided to do that. Yes. Can you see that? Yes. Back up to verse uh, 3. And, and go to verse 4 for time's sake. He took up our infirmities. He carried our sorrows. Look at verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. This is, this is covering different areas. 
Can you see that, friends? I want you to say this out loud. The punishment that brought me peace was on him. What was on him? Now, that's, that's another word for chastisement chastisement. Now the word chastise, we, would, we don't use that word all that much today. Uh, we would probably use the word uh, whipping or beating. It means to inflict punishment on. It means to whip or to beat with blows like with a stick or a reed, something hard. We'd, we'd say a stick or a rod being beat with it. So the, the beating brought us peace. Amen. And the stripes brought us healing. Amen. We have to watch about just lumping all this together and not seeing what was covered. These are not resulting in the same thing. If you say, people talk about redemption. The blood of the Lamb has saved us, yes. Amen. When, when did He pay for our sins? Well, when He went to the cross. Well, why did He go to the scourging post? Well, that paid for our sins. Well, I thought going to the cross did that. And then He was mocked and He was ridiculed. He was smitten with blows, a crown of thorns was made and jammed on his head. And then they took sticks. We're going to read it in just a minute. And they beat on that crown of thorns on his head. That's another thing. From him being tied to the whipping post and taking the stripes. Amen. That's right. Was it all just redundant? Repetitive for no reason? Unnecessary? What's happening in these things? Well, we're told right here. Back up again. Verse 4. He took our infirmities. He carried our sorrows. Verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. Those spikes pierced him. Didn't they? He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment, and again, that's being beat, like with a rod, brought us peace. And by his stripes, that brought us healing. I hear gears turning. Uh, go with me to, uh, well, you, you go to Matthew, the 27th chapter, and we're going to put up some other verses on the screen on our way to that. Go, go please to Matthew 27. You believe in with me this evening? Matthew 27. Uh, Jesus said, I'm just going to read some things to you. You can put them on the screen. You don't try to turn to all this. John 10, 17. Jesus said, My Father loves me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man takes it from me. I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. The Father God told him that, gave him that, that word. And it was demonstrated when they came to take him in the garden. You remember that? And he said, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am. And man, they all hit the ground. You remember that? What's that demonstrating? Ain't nobody taking him unless he lets them take him. And didn't he say, he said, don't you know, I could call on the Father and legions of angels, is that right, would come and deliver him? Oh, but aren't we thankful he didn't? Because if he had been delivered, we'd be lost. But I, I'm just emphasizing the point that nothing happened of any of these things 
because Jesus was powerless to do anything about it. Every one of these things had been prophesied just like this passage in Isaiah centuries before. Have you ever read Psalm 22? Yes, sir, I, I mean, it is word for word what's happening on the cross. Yes. Details of what happened and how. Not a bone of him will be broken. You might remember all this? They looked upon him whom they had pierced. I mean, thing after thing after thing. This is not just something that happened. Every one of these things is redemptive. Him being our, our sacrifice, the Lamb of God sacrificed for us. John 19, don't turn there, but the uh, the, the chief priest were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And in verse 11, uh, Jesus boldly told uh, Pilate, he said, you could have no power at all against me, Amen. except it was given you from above. That's one of the things that shocked Pilate, is this guy is not even scared of him. <laughs> and, and you remember with Herod and some of those other guys, he wouldn't even answer them. He would not even respond to them. Most people would be, you know, in that day and age, they'd have been begging for their life. Begging, begging, please spare my life. Don't crucify me. Don't kill me. He didn't do any of that. And it's obvious that it's not happening beyond the plan of God. Yep. All of this was planned. Can you see this, friends? Amen. And what was happening, you think about the, uh, the scourging. You could die just from the scourging, from that alone. And the reason why he was even scourged to begin with, according to uh, Pilate, he kept saying in Luke 23, 16, I will chastise him and release him. He thought that would be enough. And he had to release one anyway that day. And he, he thought he had it figured out. And he said it again in verse 22. They kept saying, crucify him, crucify him. And he said, why? What evil has he done? I found no cause of death in him. I will chastise him and let him go. Yep. But he didn't let him go. So he not only got crucified, he also got scourged and all the other things. None of this was normal. And none of it was necessary if you're going to just execute somebody. In fact, they probably preferred them in better shape so they'd hang on the cross longer. But every one of these things was not for him. It was for me. It was for you. Because something was happening on the outside you could see, but something else was happening on the inside you couldn't see represented by what was happening on the outside. Now, Matthew 27, are you there? Matthew 27. Oh, get ready to shout. Get ready to get free. What will the truth do for you? What will it do for you? Matthew 27, 26. Then released he Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered to him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. Why? Because they had said that he had said and others had said he was a king. This was his big offense that he's a king. How many understand he's not just a king. He's the king of kings. Was and he is and always will be. But that was the terrible thing that he should die for. Because they even the religious leaders stood up there and shouted we, we don't have any ruler except Caesar. Mm. So they then plaited a crown of thorns and they put it where? 
on his head. Now, I want you to remember the prophecy. The chastisement, which means beating, whipping, of our what? Peace. Peace. Peace was what? On him. On him. Uh-huh. They put it on his head. And they put a reed in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him mocking and saying, Hell, King of the Jews. And then they spit on him. Hell, King of the Jews. And they took a reed. A reed's a stick. And they smote him where? On the head. Well, when you hit somebody on the head with, a, with thorns on their head, what's that going to do? It drives the thorns into the scalp and blood. Was this necessary? For, I mean, he, now, then he goes on to the cross and he's nailed there. Why is all this necessary? Why wouldn't our sins be laid on him at the cross? And that's the end of it. Everything is paying for something that we need. What's being paid for here? Thorns are jamming down into your skull and whack, whack, jam down in. The Bible tells us what that was for. For our peace. For our peace. Not just that we can have peace. Our peace has been bought and paid for with a terrible price. For me to act like I can't have peace in this life is to disrespect what he did to get it for me. That's why in the same breath that he says, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let your heart be afraid. What did he say? My peace I am giving to you. Not like the world. You can't find this in the world. You can't find it in a bottle or a pill. You can't find it in anything. But I'm giving you my peace. What would give him the right to do that? We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it because he took the place of our mental anguish, our depression and torment. And you're going to see more evidence of it as we keep going. What are they doing? They're spitting on him. They're hitting him. They're whacking him. These thorns. This is before he's on the cross. Unnecessary? Beyond his control? No. And no. Part of the plan of God. Part of redemption price paid. And why did he take our sins? So we could have his righteousness. Why was our sicknesses and and pains laid on him so we could be healed? Why was the the beating uh, of our peace on him so we could have the peace that passes understanding when everything's going wrong all around us, we can be like calm on the inside and have peace on our hearts and minds no matter what's going on. Is, Is it normal? Not according to the world. It's not even natural. It's supernatural. Hallelujah. And it's bought and paid for by your Savior. Do you believe it, saints? Do you believe it? And then they they took the robe off her. They mocked him. And then finally they took the robe off him and put his own clothes and led him away to crucify him. Verse 41, the chief priest there at the cross, they're mocking him. And the scribes and the elders, and they said, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. Come down from the cross and we'll believe you, king of Israel, mocking him. He trusted God, let him deliver him if he'll have him. Because he said, I'm the son of God. The thieves that were crucified with him cast the same thing in his teeth. From the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. And that is to say what? My God. My God. 
My God, why have you forsaken me? Now, is the master troubled? Yes. Well, listen to the words. My God. My God, why have you forsaken me? Is he troubled? Yes. Is he vexed? Yes. Is something pressing him? Yes. Huh? Yes. 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 You know why? <laughs> Is he experiencing pressure, yes. oppression, yes. anxiety? Yes. The chastisement of our peace was on him. So we could have this. Oh, friend, can you see this? Yes, now, not to say he got out of faith because what was the last words that he said? Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And then he breathed his last and gave up the ghost. Amen. But why is he experiencing this obvious vexation? It's part of the curse for breaking God's law. Go to Deuteronomy 28. I got, I got just a couple of scriptures for you. Somebody said, I'm going to need to think about this. I hope so. I hope so. I hope you think a lot about it. Get in these scriptures. Look them up. Read them. See what the Lord says to your heart about it. Anybody believe in redemption? Anybody believe Jesus was our substitute? You believe that? He did he take your place? Yes. Just in a couple areas. Did he miss some areas? Yes. Did he take your place? Yes. Spirit, yes. soul, yes. and body. Did he do it? Yes, sir. Did he do it? Yes. Then am I redeemed? Yes. Are you redeemed? Yes. Spirit, yes. soul, yes. and body. Yes, sir. <laughs> Every part of us. That includes your mind. Deuteronomy 28. Anybody know what's in Deuteronomy 28? The blessings and the curses of either keeping or not keeping God's law. If you did what the Lord said and obeyed Him and lived for Him, You'd be blessed when you went out, blessed when you came back in, blessed in your basket and your store, everything you set your hand to. Your enemies would run away several different ways. Is that right? I mean, your crops would be blessed, your basket, your store. First half of the chapter sounds mighty good. But the last half of the chapter sounds terrible. And it was the result of if you don't, if you decide I don't care about God, I'm not living for God, I don't care what he said, I'm not doing anything he said, and you ignore him, and you rebel against him, then he said all these curses are going to come on you. You'll be cursed when you go out, when you come back in. Your basket, fruit of your body, your, flock, your flocks and herds, cursed, cursed. You'll go out against your enemy and he'll run uh, over you and you'll run away seven different ways. Just the opposite of the blessing. It's all turned on its head. But I want you to notice what is part of the curse of the law. 27. The Lord will smite you with the botch of Egypt. Now you don't have to know what that is to know you don't want it. And with the emeralds and with the scab and the itch, whereof you cannot be healed. And the Lord will smite you with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. And you'll grope in the noonday as the blind gropes, and you'll not prosper in your ways. And you'll be what? Oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man will save you. Now skip down to 65. It, it continues to go on that you'll, you'll be driven out of your land and, and have to serve, be forced to serve other gods in a foreign land. And, and verse 65, among these nations you shall find no ease, neither shall the sole of your foot have rest, but the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing of the eyes, and sorrow of mind. 
Is this being upset? Is this being scared and worried? It, it is. And your life will hang in doubt before you, and you'll have fear day and night, and you'll have none assurance of your life. In the morning you'll say, would God it were evening. And in the evening you'll say, would God it was morning. For the fear of your heart wherewith you shall fear, and the sight of your eyes which you shall see. Is this mental anguish? Yes. And solical anguish? No. Anybody know Galatians 3.13? Put Galatians 3.13 on the screen, please. Somebody said, why in the world would you read such terrible things? Because we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. We were just reading in the curse of the law. Part of the curse of the law is mental anguish and mental and solical and emotional torment. And the scripture says, the New Testament says in Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Did he hang on a tree? Did the curse come on him? In the mocking, the spitting, the beating, the being stripped, the thorns on the head, the, the scourging on the whipping post, and hanging on the cross. Did Jesus, he never sinned, but did our sins come on him? Did he become sin with our sin? And what's the wages of sin? Death in every realm. And the cause of every sickness, of every disease, of every pain came on him. Every kind of mental anguish and torment came on him. Did he know what it was like to, to experience hopelessness and desperation? Where is God? Huh? People say, well, nobody knows. He, he not only knows what you have ever felt like, he knows what all of us have ever felt like. It came on him with the full force of death. Amen. Why? He never sinned. Why? Why is he letting this happen to him? Why did he let him uh, jam those thorns into his, his, his scalp? Why did he let him beat him with these reeds and spit on him and mock him? Why? Why? For you, for me, so I never have to go 30 minutes in desperation and fear because he took that for me and he gave me his peace. Hallelujah. Am I reading Bible, saints? Am I reading Bible? Come on, somebody say, Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say it again. Say it, say it further. Amen. The chastisement, the chastisement of, my of my peace was on him, was on him. And, by his stripes, and by his stripes I am healed. I am healed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's got nothing to do with what you've heard or thought or experienced or felt. It happened centuries ago. In fact, in God's mind, it happened before the foundation of the world. It was bought. It was paid for. It's been given. Hallelujah. And now all those that will believe it and receive it can enjoy it. Yes, sir. And all those that ignore the word and it has no place and they don't respect it, they'll continue to mop along and, and grieve and worry and fear and waste most of their life. And even if they're good Christians, they'll get out of this life and they'll look back and go, I was so dumb. I did not have to go through all of that. And you, you'll see the master and you'll love him and you'll melt at his feet and you'll go, Lord, I didn't have to go through all that. And he'll say, he'll say I told you. I told you. I told you. I took it for you. You didn't have to have it. Stand on your feet, everybody.